Please take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll begin our reading at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 10. And let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the, the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Last week we cited a verse in Psalm 119, verse 71. It says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It is uh, not something we would say, Lord, afflict me, that I might learn thy statutes. But hindsight tells us that it has been good, that we have been afflicted, that we might learn. Last week we saw also that trouble often comes to God's children. God has not forgotten us. He will sustain us. He often delivers us. We need to trust God regardless of what is going on around us. We can't be distracted by the wickedness and mayhem of the world. Folks, it's normal. I'm not saying it's good, but it's normal for this fallen world. Our eyes need to be on the Savior, and our focus needs to be on the world to come. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, the Hebrew Christians, the recipients of this letter, the original recipients of this letter, were watching the, the increase in hostility around them. The world was not a friendly place to the children of God. It never has been, really. They were anticipating the day when, when serious persecution would come their way. It had come in bits and, and pieces along the way in different places. What kind of response would they have? What kind of response would you and I have if some serious persecution were to break out here in the upcoming months? It's possible. It's possible. What kind of response would we have? What kind of response would they have? Would, would they be anxious, fearful? Would they be contemplating ways to avoid or escape? Now, that's, that's perfectly normal. That's a, a normal human response. Paul and Barnabas, in the book of Acts, fled from, from one city to another to avoid persecution. Nothing wrong with that. Paul escaped the threat of death at least twice in addition to that that are recorded in the book of Acts. But in none of these cases did he compromise the faith. He never betrayed the Lord. There's some things we may have to do. There's something, some things that these folks here in the first century would have to do. Certain things that they'd be subjected to. Sometimes we can rightly avoid trouble, and sometimes we can't. It just comes. Are we ready to endure hardship for Christ's sake? The writer of Hebrews is endeavoring to prepare them for what is coming. He's warning them. He's reminding them. He's encouraging them. We, we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. Regardless of where we are, regardless of... And we may never face this. But we need to be ready. 
How can we be ready? Understand it's not a matter of, well, I need to make sure I've got enough ammunition in my house. I need to make sure that I've got enough non-perishable food items. I've got about 17 buckets of that non-perishable stuff. I can survive for months inside my house if, I, if need be. And not only that, I've got a little pump in my backyard, a hand pump, and I've got a well that goes down 723 feet, and I can pump water, and I can live off of that food, and I can survive in my basement for, for, for years if necessary. That is not what we're talking about. I know there are preppers out there. I know it's a bit of a big thing. I'm old enough to remember Y2K. I think that's where it really got a, got a big push. You know, it's amazing. Nothing happened then. Just amazing. Um, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual preparation. Because you can't live in the bomb shelter for the rest of your life. And if we are, we are not fulfilling the task that God has called us to be. I'm to be salt and light. I have a gospel to declare. And if it costs me to declare that gospel, so be it. I need to do so to fulfill my biblical responsibility. I can't sit still and live in hiding and keep my mouth shut and hopefully no one will notice that I'm a Christian. Because then I'm failing in my responsibilities to God. I need to be ready spiritually, and that's what he's talking about here. So let's look at our, our first word, starting verse 12. He says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Um, and I suppose you're thinking, okay, there's all kinds of medical uh, reasons for this, and this is uh, using medical language of the first set. Actually, what we have here is an idiom, which is a figure of speech. Uh, and so to, to lift up the hands which hang down, deal with the feeble knees, that's uh, mentioned several times in pagan literature. It's, it's uh, mentioned once or twice in the Old Testament. It's dealing with my inability to do what I'm supposed to be doing. I am unable to work. I'm unable to fight. It's dealing with general weakness. I am unfit for the, for the challenge physically and in this case spiritually. I'm just, I'm just not up to it. I'm just not, you know, I, uh, and then it says make straight paths for your feet. Uh, there's been a number of, I am not a big hiker. I like to go for walks. I, I, I try to go for a walk uh, most days of the week. I try to walk, I know this is no big deal. I try to walk at least three or four miles a day. I know a couple of you are like, oh, it's nothing. They say, you walk that far, so, you know, we, I get the eighth of line. I can, I can awe some of you and the other people can roll your eyes. All right, um, but there's several times I've been someplace where I'm, I'm on this, and I, oh, I'd like to go here. I'd like to see this. And uh, there are times where I will look at this, and I have to make an evaluation. Am, am I, am I going to have enough strength to get there and back? Or am I going to use, and because I've had this happen before, am I going to use all my steam to get there? And then the trip back is just going to be all I can take to be able to, to manage it. Spiritually, am I fit for the task? For what lies ahead or may lie ahead, am I spiritually fit to deal with this? Boy, that's a, that's a long hike. There's a lot of up and down, a lot of, a lot of vertical in that. I don't, how much... Uh, how much my wife and I, when we were in, in Smoky Mountain National Park, we, we, we took a hike, and I tell you what, that was a, that was a long hike. I, I got my step counter on my phone. We did 18,000 steps that day, and, which for me was like, whoa, that's huge. Um, and, uh, but I had, I had to carefully evaluate, am I going to make it there and get it back? Because if I don't, we're going to have to call for help, and they're going to have to pack me out, because you can't drive to where we're going. Praise the Lord, I made it, and I enjoyed it, and I had a great time, and actually went for another shorter hike after that. But I had to think about that. Am I going to do it? And when we look at the possibilities of what's going on around the world, remember, keeping our eyes on Jesus, but being aware of, of what's going on around us, am I overcome by fear? Am I overcome by anxiety? If so, I am preoccupied with everything that's going on around me, and I don't have my eyes on the Lord. I need to be spiritually strong enough to be able to deal with, with whatever comes. Now, understand that my spiritual strength is not me. Spirit, I am indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. I need to make sure that I have access 
to the power that God has given me. How do we get that? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I need to submit myself to God. I need to let God have me. I'm not holding back. I'm not saying, oh, God, you can have this part of my life and this part and this part. But, you know, this part I really like and I really enjoy. And I know there's some problems with it, but, but this is going to hang on to. Then you're not devoted to the Lord. You're willing to let God have the things that, that really don't matter a whole lot to you or where you, uh, you and God are on the same page. Oh, to do this is, is fine with me, so I'll let God have that. You're unwilling to sacrifice something that you, you love or that you enjoy or that might cost you. And so we need to be prepared. I need to let God have me. My stuff, my, my belongings, my, my, my goals, my aspirations, my time. I need to let God have, have me. And I will be empowered and I need to immerse myself in God's word. I need to, to, to live, let God have me 100%. 24-7, I need to be God's. And God will empower me and God will strengthen me. God will give me the grace to do what I need to do. He says in verse 13, And make straight paths for your, for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather, rather let it be healed. Making straight paths for your, for your feet. There's several different ideas here. One is, um, so, so if you have children, you've experienced this. You're, you're getting up in the middle of the night, and you're, you have to go to the kitchen or something, and it's dark. And I'll, I'll use this one. You step on a Lego with those very sharp corners. There's, there's something in your path that is going to cause you to stumble and maybe shout and, uh, and possibly injure yourself either on the thing or in your response to the thing that you stepped on. We need to make sure that the, the path is, is clear. Part of that is helping one another. Helping one another as far as keeping that path clear. Keeping on the, on the straight and narrow. One of the, if, if you have ever read Pilgrim's Progress... Uh, there's a section where the road gets really, really rough. And as Pilgrim's going on this thing, he's walking along, and it's just, it's just a rough, it's full of, of rocks and, and holes, and it's just hard. It's the road he's supposed to be on. But it's a, it's a hard, hard road. And then he looks right over here, and there's this, this beautiful, smooth path. And it seems to be running parallel to where he's going. Why don't I just go over there? It seems so much easier. And so he does. And of course, he gets into all sorts of trouble because he got off the path he's supposed to be on. The path I'm supposed to be on sometimes is rough. Sometimes it's difficult. And we need to be a help and encouragement to one another to help remove the obstacles to keep that path the way it's supposed to be. I need to remain on the straight and narrow. I need to stay on the, the road map of righteousness. And I need to deal with the, the dangerous obstacles. The strong need to, to help the weak. And so set that proper course. Make straight paths for your feet. And he says here, and the reason you need to do this, he says, lest, I'm sorry, let me put these on. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it, rather let it be healed. The idea of turned out of the way is, is get injured or, or put out of joint. My, uh, my daughter, what was it about, Aaron, was this about a year and a half ago? She went, she went on hiking, hiking in the North Cascades, and they had signed up for this in advance, and she and three friends were going to be hiking up to the, you've probably been there, Jeff, uh, this beautiful lake. And uh, up there at the, near the timber line, and you've got all these stunted trees and this beautiful, reflect, just gorgeous setting. And, and she starts, and she goes, and she gets about a mile and a half into this thing, and she rolled her ankle. And so they left her with enough supplies, and she went a little bit further, than, and, and she said, I just, I just can't do this. And so so uh, it was a day hike, so they went up, and, and she, she, she worked her way back down to, to camp, and, and she didn't get ahead of them too much before they arrived because they had made the round trip all the way back up and all the way down by the time she finally got down because she had injured herself on that, that trip. 
And so we need to make sure that we don't get injured, that, we, that we are, uh, things don't get out of joint, that we're not tripped up. And that's sure to happen if we get off the, the path we're supposed to be on. We can be deceived, we can be led astray, we can be uh, enamored by things that are, that are the shiny object that's, that's pulling off, off the, the path. Because the, the path I'm supposed to be on is difficult enough as it is. The world lures us with things that make it look easier, more attractive, but we know that the reality is that if we get off the path that God has chosen for us, it's not really the, an easy path. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a great hardship. And so we need to be walking faithfully on that path. Am I prepared for this? And again, the whole idea is be prepared. You know, the Boy Scout, Boy Scout motto was, was be prepared. And so we always need to be, be ready, tapping into the Lord's strength. And he says, rather let it be healed. So let me ask you a, a very pointed question. Right now, right now where you're sitting, right now, are you right with God? Are you right with God? I'm not asking for a response. I'm just asking you the question. Are you right with God right now? Is there something spiritually damaged with you that needs to be fixed? Do you need spiritual strengthening? Do you need spiritual restoration? Because we may be on a difficult path. Life is a difficult path. And if you're going to walk faithfully with God, you need to get these things taken care of. You may fool the people around you. You may even fool yourself. But you're not going to fool God. Are you walking with him? Is your source of strength God himself? Are you walking in fellowship with him? Are you right with God right now? Then he says this, verse 14, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So we need to have peace, first of all, with, with other people. Fellow believers... It's, it's amazing. You hear stories. Thankful, I am grateful that we've never had anything major here at Grace. But it's amazing the stories that I have heard. It is amazing some of the things I've seen as I've traveled around and preached different churches over the years. The, the fighting and the strife that goes on in a church is just mind-boggling. The book of Proverbs, verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but what the well-advised is wisdom. Why is it that there's so much fighting in a church? Now, if you're dealing with a theological issue or a sin problem, it needs to be dealt with, period. But I dare say that most of the conflict in churches has nothing to do with those. It's dealing with personalities. It's dealing with personal pride. Differences of opinion over things the Bible doesn't speak on. Only by pride cometh contention. I'm right and you're wrong, and you just better accept it. Well, I think I'm right and you're wrong, and we're going to have to see who's going to feed, who's going to win this. And, you know, you've all heard the story about, uh, you know, one of the perks of renting a building is we don't have to argue over which color the carpet is. Uh, the, the, the battles over, over silly and ridiculous things. I know a pastor out east that uh, when they built their building, he didn't tell anybody what color the building was, uh, what, the, what the, the, the color of the chairs were going to be, what the color of the carpet was going to be, what kind of light fixtures. Are. He did it all, and he didn't tell anybody. And when they came and they saw, they all oohed and odd, and everybody was happy. <laughs> Thankfully, he had good taste, but still, you know, you're gonna, we're going to, why ask for trouble? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2. And the Philippian church, by the way, is a great church. Uh, you read about, you read the epistles and you see about this church having this problem, this problem, this problem. Philippians are, the Philippians were great. They were phenomenal as far, but we got, we got, there's some hints, some subtle hints. In chapter 4 and verse, and by the way, this is a church also that Paul traveled through frequently. Anytime he went from, from the Roman province of Asia, where Ephesus and so on are, and, and, the, and, and going to Corinth, anytime he went there, 
he would occasionally take a ship, but very often, more often, he would travel by land. And if he did that, he went through Philippi. And so he knows these people, he knows them by name, he's, there, he's been there often. He knows what the issues are. And not only that, he's writing Philippians from, from prison in Rome, and the Philippians, so, so dutiful to him, had one of their own, one of the Philippians, had traveled to Rome to help Paul while he was there on, in imprisonment. And so this guy also is going to let Paul know what's going on there in Philippi. So he says in chapter 4 and verse 2, I beseech you, Odeus, and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I'm going to suggest that these two ladies were the, the two head honchos as far as making sure that all the stuff in the church happened. Whether we're dealing with the social or taking care of the needy or maybe the, you know, whatever the case may be. But these are two ladies that are very, 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 very much involved. And they do some of this. Well, I think it ought to be this way. Well, I think it ought to be this way. And he says, I beseech these two ladies that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Strife. Strife should be out of character for the Christian. <clears throat> if you have strife in a church, folks, you have a spiritual problem. And instead of fighting it out and finally one party winning and the other party getting mad and leaving, you've got a spiritual problem and it needs to be resolved. Sometimes it's both of them, sometimes it's one of them. Odds are... It's both of them. I've been in the ministry for over 35 years. I have done a fair bit, not a huge amount, but I've done a fair bit of counseling. I have yet to come across, and when I'm dealing with, with marriage counseling or anything, I have yet to come across a situation where it's 100% and nothing. I've come across one or two where it was, you know, 80 20. But usually it's a 40-60 or a 45-55 or, you know, it's, it's pretty close. There's, sin, there, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of wrong to go around. And so strife ought to be out of character for the Christian. It shouldn't be something that we're noted for. You know, the early Christians, the pagans recognized, you know, the, one of the outstanding things, and, and our Lord talks about this. In advance, that one of the notable things about the early Christians was what they, is that they loved one another. And very often these days, the perception is, oh, those Christians, how they hate each other. How they despise each other. How they love to fight with one another. Now, granted, sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to take a stand for, for right and wrong and what is biblical and for truth. But as I mentioned beginning... I think that's the minority of the cases. The majority of the cases, these things are personal. And when we're dealing with personal, we're dealing with pride. And when we're dealing with personal, it's a spiritual problem and not a matter of right and wrong. And so we need to make sure that there's not strife. He says, be at peace with all men. Now, we've dealt with dealing with believers. That's the easy part, or at least should be. But dealing with everybody out there, the whole lot, can't we all just get along? Um, in Romans chapter 12 and, and verse 18, Paul says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I love the caveat, though. It's a blessing. As much as lieth in you. Because you can't always live at peace. If that were the case, then the persecution... Wouldn't happen. We'd have nothing to worry about. These people here in, in the, that are addressed in the book of Hebrews wouldn't have anything to worry about. There's no fear. There's no anxiety. We're all just going to get along. There's no problem here. And that's not the case. The world, people who are lost, people who do not know Christ as Savior, are children of the devil and in bondage to sin, and they hate God and they hate God's children. Whether they are willing to acknowledge that or not, the scripture says it's the case. So as much as 
lieth in you. If it is at all possible, live at peace with the world without compromising. But we need to make sure that, because the goal is evangelism. If I make myself obnoxious for the sake of, frankly, being obnoxious, I am hindering my ability to do and be what God has commissioned me to do and be. If I am perceived by my neighbors as a belligerent and obnoxious person, and I want to share the gospel with them, I, I'm, I'm, I'm undermining that witness. And so in my dealings with the world, I need to make sure that the, the offense is the message and not the messenger. I need to make sure that I personally am not part of the problem. Now, some of us have repulsive personalities, and that makes it difficult. But as much as lieth in you, live at peace with all men. We need to be salt. We need to be light. Let's make sure that it's the message itself that's offensive and not the messenger. And in our conflicts, we need to make sure it's not personal. Again, there needs to be some humility. There needs to be an avoiding of misunderstandings. Make sure you get all your information. But again, look at the um, follow peace with all men and, what's that next word? Holiness. I can't sacrifice holiness for the sake of peace. My, my great relationship, the relationship, the, by far the most important relationship, is my relationship with God. And if I am willing to, to trim on holiness for the sake of getting along with these folks or these folks or these folks, that, then, that I'm doing wrong in pursuing what I perceive to be peace. Because there is to be no peace at the cost of holiness. Because my next relationship, is my, the most important relationship, is my relationship with God. And if I trim on holiness, I can't have a right relationship with God. Now, of course, our, our personal holiness, number one, is imputed. It's put to our account because we're not really holy. I know we strive for this. We deal with sanctification and so forth. It's a, it's a work of God in me. For it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, it says in Philippians 2. So God is working in me. God is bringing me more and more into the image of Christ. God is transforming me. If you, are, if you know Christ as Savior, if you are a born-again Christian, you are not what you were the day you got saved. You have been changed and transformed, and sometimes you don't even know it. But it's true. If you are a born-again believer, you have been changed. You have been transformed, and it's an ongoing process. And that changed life is an outward demonstration of an inward work of God. And if there is no change in you, then you're probably not born again. And he says, and follow holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I cannot have like, like an audience with God. I, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I, I have access to God through Christ because God regards me as holy in the person of Christ. I am accepted into his presence. And when we step out of this life and into the next, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, we shall, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I will see him. Now, there will come a day, it says also in the scripture, that every eye shall see him. This is past the day of grace. This is only judgment. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also, which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth, shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. 
But if I am to have God as my Father, if I am to gain the presence of God, if I am to gain the, the ear of God, to come boldly into his presence, that I, might find, that I might find grace to help in time of need. That only comes from holiness. And my holiness only comes from Christ. So he gives us these, these, these warnings and these encouraging things here in verses 12 through 14. But here's the, here's the great warning. Look at verse 50. It says, looking diligently. I need to be very careful about this. I need to examine myself. Looking diligently, lest any man should fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let me make sure I don't come short of God's grace. The first one, of course, would be believers failing to access God's grace. If I, a couple of moments ago I asked you, are you are you right with God? Psalm sixty six eighteen says, "If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me." I can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It says in Ephesians chapter four and verse thirty. Personal sin will hinder my access to the grace of God. How do I grow in Christ? I know it's a relationship and so on, but what, do, what, what is scripturally? What does, what, is, what, is, what is the primary thing that God does to cause us to grow? Where do we, where do we get our fertilizer, our spiritual fertilizer? Where does that come from? The Word! The Word! See that in Ephesians 5, 26 and a number of other places. And so if I am not faithfully, consistently in the Word of God, then I am going to come short of God's grace. I will not have full access. You know, I, I remember as a new Christian, I had gotten saved at reading a gospel tract, and, and about two years later, two years later, I started attending a Bible study. I had had no formal instruction in those two years. I had read my Bible. I'd read it through without anybody teaching me. And I didn't have a study Bible, just a text Bible. And I learned a little bit and a few things here and there. But I tell you what, once I got instructed, when I had a teacher and I began to, to read and understand, boy, my spiritual life just took off. I need to immerse myself in the Word of God. And if I fail in this... I'm hindering my, my spiritual life. I want you to turn back. I think I've got the right, uh, the right text here. No, I'm looking at the wrong one. It'll be in the next chapter. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. A failure to fellowship with the saints will hurt you spiritually. Well, I do, and I'm, I'm saying this to the folks who aren't here, I do television, I do, I do t church on TV, I do t uh, or, or church on, on the computer. I am grateful for this, by the way. We are able to reach people that could, would otherwise not be, be reached. There are people who can't come, and therefore they watch or listen. That's not what that's talking about. It's talking about, I, I choose not to fellowship with God's people. I'm, I'm more comfortable at home. It's easier. I can sit here in my pajamas and my cup of coffee. I don't have to get ready. I don't have to go anywhere. I can just sit there. I may even sing along with you folks at church. That's all good. I'm telling you, you're not fellowshipping with the saints. You're going through the motions, you're not fellowshipping with the saints. A major component of being here 
is the interaction. We, a number of years ago, we actually sat down and, and hashed out a little bit about our greeting time. Should we, because it makes some people feel uncomfortable, and should we do it? it, it and we came to the conclusion it's, it's a necessary component. I learned a long time ago that when I say you are dismissed, that you are not dismissed. That a lot of you, now some of you, you're out the door within a minute. That's fine. But there are, there, I have learned that I will not be locking the doors and shutting the building and everything for 20 or 30 minutes after the close of the service. Because what we had in our little greeting time at the beginning of the service continues on. And there are the conversations and the interaction and, and, and the fellowship. That is a necessary component of your Christian growth. Was it Proverbs 27, 17? Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We need to be helping one another, encouraging one another. Part, part, of, part of the fellowship is accountability. That's why occasionally uh, I'll say, by the way, if you notice somebody that hasn't been here for a few weeks, that's one of the reasons we have a directory. Give them a call. See how they're doing. Make sure everything's well. And so personal sin, a failure to be in the Word, and a failure to fellowship with the saints, all of, us, all of those things will hurt us spiritually. It will limit our access to God's grace. But also I think the primary thing he's talking about here is those who will abandon the faith. The world is filled, churches, Bible preaching, Bible teaching churches are filled with fair weather Christians. They come because they enjoy the singing. They come because <laughs> they enjoy the food. They come because of maybe some personal relationships. But they are not here because they're children of God and have a hunger for the things of God. They like some of this peripheral stuff. But they are not truly God's children. And trials, when they come along, will prove what you really are. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 1 John 2.19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest. They were not all of us. Works don't make you a Christian, but good works will prove that you are a Christian. The life you live proves what you are. Are you a child of God or are you not? He says, lest any root of bitterness spring up, and trouble you. We deal with all sorts of difficulties. We deal with in-house difficulties. We'll deal with, did I say out-house difficulties? Out-of-house difficulties. And we deal, I think, more, mostly with, with inside difficulties. I'm wrestling with things inside of me. The things going on inside my, my head. And so when the trials come, am I going to, to waver? When it really builds, when, when, when we're dealing with some serious stuff, am I going to waver? And thereby many be defiled. It's an interesting thing. Sin is often contagious. It's amazing what people will do in a crowd that they would never do individually. And sometimes that happens in churches. You've got, you got a little group of people over here, and they're, they're just... Think about Moses in the wilderness, the children of Israel in the wilderness. How many times was there one person that stood up against Moses? I can't think of any. But oh, we got a crowd of them. They got, they got some leaders over here, and they got the whole crowd behind them, and, they're, and they're, they got a following. We've got the support behind us, and we're going to do this. 
Rebellion is contagious. Sin is contagious. Can be. Let's any root of bitterness springing up and thereby many be defiled. Hardship will drive me to God or away from God. I've seen both and I've seen lots of both. The finest Christians I know are people who have, have been through some, some trials and difficulties and found that God's grace is enough. And the meanest, nastiest, most embittered Christians I've ever come across, those who, who were probably born again, are people who have been hard, through hardship and difficulty and grow angry and embittered with God. And thereby many be defiled. He says in verse 16, now we're going to come to an illustration. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Lest there be any fornicator. Sexual sin, by the way, and this is the, the, the general word for this. And it's a generic term. Sexual sin will defile the individual and the church. In the first century, you have the majority of Christians had a pagan background. Sexual sin was part of the worship in paganism in the first century. It was commonplace. Society accepted it. And it was readily available and was a constant problem. We see this especially in Corinth. We read the, you read the Corinthian epistles. This is a big problem for those folks. No wonder the, the church was filled with trouble. Widespread problem in the other church due to that pagan background. It is just as widespread, if not worse, today. Really, we're not pagans. We have the per pervasiveness of pornography. We have clandestine online relationships, people carrying on via the computer. And we have, as we have seen in the last just several years, this, this it's just over-the-top normalization of depravity in our culture. And I will let you know that it's not just out there. There is way too much of it here. Now, sexual sin is also used in the Bible metaphorically. And by that I mean idolatry. If you are a worshiper of God and something else takes God's place, that's spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. And so if I'm going through great persecution and I abandon God for something else, maybe my own life, I have made myself my own, my own idol. Or profane person. Somebody who is godless or, or has a disregard for the things of God. Both of these, by the way, would apply to someone who, who abandons the faith. And both would apply to Esau. So let's look at the, the illustration here. Who for one morsel of meat, or for food, sold his birthright. Esau was the man's man. He was the hairy guy. He was the hunter. He was the older son. His grandfather was Abraham. And by the way, if the chronology, there was some overlap. He probably had spent some time with his grandfather Abraham. The covenant that God made with Abraham was passed on to Isaac. Isaac was the recipient of the covenant. That's restated a number of times. 
And God had said that the line would pass to Isaac's children, to his son. Which one? We have Esau, we have Jacob. Which of these two? And both of them have got some issues. <laughs> Go back and read Genesis. Which of these two is going to be the one who's going to be the recipient of the covenant, the blessing, the promise of God? Well, in normal circumstances, it's the oldest. That's what Isaac favored. He sought to bless Esau. But Esau doesn't have any regard for the things of God. Esau is more important for the, for the more, more, has much more regard for the moment than he does for eternity. And I'll guarantee you the whole idea of the covenant was something that was known and talked about and considered a great treasure in that extended family. But Esau has no regard. Esau comes in from hunting, he's tired, he's hungry, and, and, and Jacob likes to mess around in the kitchen. And he made a big pot of lentil soup, and he bakes some bread. Esau comes in, he says, hey, give me some of that. Now, Jacob is the opposite as far as him regarding the covenant. He recognizes that he is not the heir because he's the second son, but he also recognizes the character of his brother. Let's make a deal. I'll give you a bowl of soup and all the bread you can eat if you'll swear to me that I have the birthright. Esau says, I'm ready to starve. What good is this birthright going to do me? Well, swear to me. Okay, I swear. Give me the bread. And for a bowl of soup and some bread, he gave away the most important treasure he ever, ever would have had. A profane person. It's been said, never sacrifice the permanent on the altar of the immediate. Esau's not acting out of ignorance. This would have been a common theme, something he had thorough knowledge of. It's why they're in the, in the land of Canaan as it is, instead of living over in what is now Iraq. His whole demeanor, his whole deal is simply a demonstration of his lack of faith, of his godlessness, his disregard for the things of God. And he threw away what was really important. He was the heir to God's promise to Abraham. It's not important. I'm more concerned about a full belly about pleasing God or having any regard for God. And then it says this. For you know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, when the time came, he was rejected. No, you gave that up. You gave that up. For he now found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I want something I can't have. I gave it away. And now it's too late. You know, even if I'm not right with God right now, I can have forgiveness and I can be restored to God right now. Now, I will tell you that some things are irrevocable and there's some things that can't be fixed. There are some sins that I can, I can commit that will have lifelong on this planet, in this life, in this body. There are certain sins that I can commit that have, have long-lasting, lifelong implications. But with God, I can have forgiveness. I can have a right relationship with God now. But some things, some things can't be fixed. I had eggs for breakfast. I, I, I can't... You know, once I, once, I, once I did this, I can't, I can't put, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't want to have that many. I, I just put it back together again. You can't do it. There's certain things that can't be fixed. I can have a right relationship with God. Eternity is squared away. I'm right with God. I have full access to the grace of God as far as eternity is concerned. in conjunction with some of the things we've been looking at, testimony is a very important thing. My, 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 my testimony, I mean my reputation, my Christian reputation. 
my Christian reputation with other people, my Christian reputation in the community. There are certain things that I can say and do that would demolish very quickly, very simply, my reputation, my testimony. And depending on the nature of what it is and who I am, I could never get it back. That's why there are certain sins that a preacher can do that would prevent him from ever being back up in the pulpit. I've lost my, my reputation. I've hindered my testimony. I'm a reproach. Yes, I've gotten right with God. Yes, I've gotten it right as best I can, but there are certain things I can't fix. So how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I deal with that? Well, number one, when it says make straight paths to your feet, don't do that in the first place. There's a lot of things we can avoid. But if you have, God's grace is sufficient. Again, some things you can't fix with people, but can always be fixed with God. We need to be prepared. Hard times may be experienced by all of us, probably will be in one degree or another. If we rest on our own strength, we will fail. Our power, our, our reliance must be on the Lord. If I'm going to succeed in the Christian life, period, whether there's hardship or not, I'm dependent on the Lord. And if hardship comes, I must be dependent on the Lord. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Are you right with God right now? Are you prepared for whatever may come down your path? The hardship, the difficulty. Are you prepared? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the warnings. Father, your children throughout history have had hardship and difficulty. Sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it's from the government. Sometimes it's in society. Sometimes it's combinations of these things. Father, may we walk faithfully with you. May we draw our strength from you. You are our source of strength. You are our source of power. Father, may we live life with you, empowered by you, and for you. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.